I probably would have left it alone and moved on with my life without her, but it was his smirk that did it. He made me act with that smirk, and whether she saw it or not, their complete disrespect tore my soul. It was obvious that Samantha, with whom I had lived for six years, would not be my wife for long. Part of the problem in our marriage was that I had been working too much for the last six months. I was in line for a major promotion, and with it would come a very significant increase in wages. This meant Sam could quit her job and we could start our family. The other problem was that Samantha is a beautiful woman, one of those stunning beauties who never learn to be a bitch when men flirt with her. She doesn't exactly flirt back, but she has a wonderful smile that sends the wrong signal. Since Sam looks so much like Scarlett Johansson, with the same beautiful face and great body, just taller, men are naturally drawn to her. I had my suspicions for some time. She worked late too often and had to travel out of town more often but the grin on his face at their company's holiday party was irrefutable proof. I almost had to force Sam to invite me to this party, and now I know why. Respect is an important thing in my family. By the way, my name is John Simoncelli. If you'll give me a few minutes, I'll give you just one example. In high school, I was the best player on the school team. It was early in the season, and we were facing the team that had the best chance of keeping us out of the championship. The opposing pitcher threw a fastball right at my head. The ball missed my face, but hit my helmet. I stood up and ran first. I looked at the pitcher and he gave me a smirk, and then quietly mouthed, Bastard. I rushed at him and surprised the crap out of him. Instead of playing like most baseball fights, I punched him right in the nose, breaking it and getting blood all over his nice white uniform. After that, all hell broke loose. I was suspended pending a hearing on whether I would be permanently disqualified. My coach was pretty disgusted with me, but my old man agreed with me when he took me home. I saw what that asshole did and I said to myself, you can't let these clowns disrespect you. Everything will go to waste after they find out what I did. However, the coach's disapproval bothered me. He's been my coach for the last three years and I wanted him to respect me. When I showed up at his office the next day, he gave me a lecture that I never forgot, until now. Why do you care what some scumbag tells you? You know where I grew up, at the intersection of State and 75th Street, where some thug was always trying to piss me off. I'm lucky. Neither my mother nor my father would tolerate any fighting. It helped me stay on track to college and get out of the slums. Now I live where I want. I'm doing what I love, and these stupid thugs are either dead, in jail, or living in a room with a needle in their arm. So here's the thing. If you play with me again, there will be no more fights, no matter the circumstances. As a result, I was suspended for three games. Someone was keeping an eye on me because Ron Mueller, the opposing catcher, showed up at the hearing. He seemed disgusted with the way his coach was trying to win. Their coach ordered the pitcher to throw that ball with the intention of disqualifying me forever. Ron didn't want to win the title that way and saved my ass. Ron ended up being the catcher on my college team and eventually the best man at my wedding to Sam. Let's get back to the present. I could have gotten over this if Samantha had shown a little respect and just said, it's over and I'm leaving. I've been dumped before. Not since college though and not from the woman who stood in front of hundreds of our friends and family and vowed to love me forever, but I could handle it. Believe me, ever since Sam chose her path by apparently sleeping with her co-worker, Jacob Harris, and coming home to give me a few seconds, I felt like one of those cartoon characters. My coach on one shoulder whispers in my left ear, take the high road and go, and my father on the other shoulder screams in my right ear, crush them both, son. It didn't take me long or any secret spy tricks to get the concrete evidence I needed. On the Monday morning after a party at her company, I quit my job hired a divorce lawyer, and hired a private investigator. The first night that week when Sam called me and told me she was working late, I called the ex-police detective and he followed them to the asshole's townhouse. There are no photos of them actually having sex, but I'm sure they didn't spend two hours in his townhouse analyzing spreadsheets. Everything was ready for Sam's next visit to his home. She called me on Friday night to let me know that she and a couple of women from the office were going out for drinks and dinner. Don't wait, John. 
It's been a while since I had a bachelorette party. An hour after her call, I drove to the address the detective gave me and saw Sam's car parked in the driveway. I knocked on the door and was surprised when he opened the door, standing in his robe with the same grin. Never mind, John. I have a black belt in karate. I'm not here to start anything, Jacob. She's yours now, and the last thing I need is a lying, cheating bitch as a wife. Tell Sam to come to the door so I can deliver these papers. I showed him an envelope made of thick paper. I called, Sam, come down the stairs. There's no need to hide. Sam came down the stairs wearing a robe identical to the assholes. I almost smiled. Sam, here are the divorce papers. Find yourself a lawyer and ask him or her to contact mine to negotiate a settlement. Do not come home tonight or any time until tomorrow evening. By then I will have taken my things from our apartment and you can return. Sam took the envelope as if it were radioactive. John, my parents and my brother's family were supposed to come over for brunch tomorrow. What should I tell them if I'm not there? No problem, Sam. Just before I came here, I emailed your brother and gave him this address. I told him that you and Jacob would be hosting your family here, not in our apartment. I assume he will receive the message in time. If not, I will inform them of the change of venue when they arrive tomorrow. Bye. I looked at Sam. She started to break down and cry, but then I saw it on her left hand, and I almost lost my composure. Sam, you didn't even have the decency to take off my grandmother's wedding ring while you were having sex with that bastard? Give it to me now. The ring you gave me is in the envelope with the divorce papers. Sam completely broke down, but still took the ring off her finger. I left without saying another word. I wasn't entirely surprised when the doorbell rang at 11 Quas on Saturday morning. Perhaps her brother did not receive my email on time after all. This is going to be awkward, I thought as I looked out the window and saw Sam's family on the porch. I had no idea how awkward it was until I opened the door. John, we're sorry. I received your email and spoke with Sam. Can we come in and talk? Over the next hour, her brother, mother, and father did everything they could to convince me that I should let Sam home and give up the divorce. It seems Sam went to her brother's house after I left her and Jacob. She admitted everything and asked them for help. Sam knew that I loved her mom and dad, especially since my parents moved to the Sunshine State after my dad retired. The three of them talked about counseling, forgiveness, and pity. I spent the next hour trying to convince them that this wouldn't happen. No one was happy and there were no smiles when they left. It took all my willpower not to hug my mother-in-law when she walked out onto the porch. She was crying and I wanted to tell her that everything was okay, but it wasn't, and I didn't hug her. We spent the next few months dancing against each other as usual until the divorce became final. She wanted to talk, but I didn't. Her lawyer asked for advice. Mine said it would be a waste of time and money. The marriage was irrevocably destroyed due to my wife's infidelity. A week before the divorcee, I was invited to Ron's house for dinner. He knew more of the nasty details about why Sam and I broke up than I did, because his wife Jelly and Samantha were still in touch occasionally. I sat in his kitchen and watched his wife Jelly prepare dinner. Jelly, as we all call her, was seven months pregnant and simply beaming. Ron saw me looking at her belly and knew what I was thinking. John, let's go out onto the porch and chat. Meet me there. I'm out of beer. I headed to the refrigerator and hugged Jelly around the waist along the way. He adores you, Jelly. Never cheat on him. Why would I do this, John? I love this man and we will soon have a little boy. I am not crazy. That's what I would have said about Samantha a year ago. Look at us now, six days after the divorce. Sam got stupid, John. I'm not nearly as dumb. Ron won't try to talk me out of this, will he? Go there and listen to what he has to say. I'll tell you what I tell Sam every time she calls. I will support you both in any way I can, short of giving either of you my opinion on what you two should do. I kissed Jelly on the cheek and went outside. I handed Ron one of the beers and waited. John, Sam wants to meet with you and talk before the divorce becomes final. She called me and asked me to invite you. There is nothing surprising. I thought about it a little because this isn't the first time she's asked. 
Why should I give her the pleasure of her repentance? All this will do is calm her down, and I'm not going to give her that. I wouldn't either, John. But let me ask you. Do you have any outstanding questions that she can answer for you? If so, put it on her. Get your questions answered first, then do whatever you want. Come out, stop and listen to anything. What he said made sense. So you didn't call me here to give her another chance? No, John, I want only the best for you. If this concerns divorce, then I agree with you. I met Sam the evening before our trial in a small cafe. We asked for a table in a quiet corner. Thank you for meeting with me, John. Sam looked like she was about to burst into tears. It took all my willpower not to think about her little hands. I didn't give her the opportunity to start a discussion. Sam, I know you have something to tell me, but first I have a couple of questions. The waiter chose this moment to take our drink orders and start talking about the chef's specialties. I interrupted him as politely as I could, ordered a bottle of wine and a chef's salad for two, and asked the waiter to please leave us alone as much as possible. He understood. Sam, my first question is, why? I thought we had something special. We were special, John, but the reasons for my actions are all old cliches. We were together and exclusive for seven years. I was seduced by a cute guy at work who complimented me on everything. You spent more and more time thinking about work or being at work. Not fair, Sam. You know I spent hours just to get promoted. You wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, and I tried to make it possible. I know that, John. I knew it then. But at the time, I was a selfish bitch, and I wanted it all. Right now, I can't believe I screwed up so bad. We were less than a year away from having our children. I even had names. Tears flowed from her eyes, and I still resisted not holding her hands. Fine. I promised myself I wouldn't ask, but I had to know. Was he that much better in bed than me? Sam surprised me. She started laughing through her tears. No, no, no. He was no match for making love. I never had to pretend with you. I shouldn't tell you this. It might only make you angrier. But the only times he filled me up were the couple of times he had dirty sex with me. He asked me so many times that I started to think he might be gay, but in fact, it was only because that was when some friction arose between us and our relationship. I'm sorry. I know I never let you do this to me, and now I'm admitting that I did it to him. Don't worry. It was never my hobby. Well, that's good, John, because your manhood has no place in a woman's ass. Sam didn't notice the waiter coming up behind her when she said this, and as he set down the wine... He took a moment to look at my lap and smiled as he walked away. Sam turned beet red, and we laughed together for the first time in six months. We finished with salads and wine. Sam spent time trying to get me to accept her apology, but I didn't give up. I told her I could someday, but that it was too rough. Too soon. As we stood up to leave, Sam dropped one last bomb on me. This is another reason for my actions. John, sometimes you can be as cold as ice. Our marriage will end tomorrow, and you are like a statue. No tears, no screams. I cry myself to sleep every night. Did you really love me? Sam, I loved you more than you can imagine. But first, let's clear a couple of things. Several times tonight, you mentioned your actions. Let's call it what it was. You cheated on me, Sam. You slept with another man when you should have been faithful, leaving everyone else behind. Secondly, whether I go home tonight and get drunk or cry is my business. Most likely, after our divorce tomorrow, you and the asshole will become a couple. He has already shown what he thinks of me by sleeping with my wife, ending my marriage and laughing at me all the while. If I cry now or tell you about my bad nights, you will definitely tell him one day. Then this arrogant idiot will laugh again at my expense. Don't push me, Sam. You don't want to see the demon that's lurking beneath the surface. The next day I didn't go to court. My lawyer took care of this. It was a modern, no fault, divorce with equitable division of property. The marriage had just ended that day. Months have passed since the divorcee. I used this time to plan. I actually received a promotion at work and a big increase in salary. But I had no one or nothing to spend it on. I probably spent too much time on the Literotica website after Ron told me about it one night over drinks. 
Ron told me the ins and outs of the loving wives category and said that there are hundreds of stories in which a jilted husband takes revenge on his ex and her lover. I read stories, take notes, and rate my favorite methods of revenge. Ideas that would land me in jail were rated pretty low. Psychological terror was rated quite highly. The ranking changed after I had the misfortune of running into Jacob one afternoon. I didn't know it at the time, but after our divorce, Jacob and Sam started dating again and were now engaged. Jacob made it clear to me that he won. I lost. Sam was a fantastic lover that he couldn't get enough of. And there must be something wrong with my sexual abilities. If Sam was so easy to get into bed with when we were married, was I a coward for turning and walking away? I wasn't afraid of Mr. Black Belt, but I just spent two years busting my ass to get this promotion, and any physical altercation would have ruined that half of my life. This guy has already ruined my personal life. Will he get satisfaction from ruining my work life too? I left. My method of retribution came to me like a bolt from the blue. That's a funny thing about some guys. They can't help themselves and dip their pen into the company's inkwell. Jacob was no exception. Sam wasn't the first woman from their group he dated. One day I received a call from Helen Smith, a woman I met at a company party. She wanted to meet me for dinner with her treats. Things were getting serious between Jacob and Helen, she thought, when he suddenly started treating her like a disease. Jacob left Helen when he decided to pursue my wife. Things became tense again between Jacob and Helen while Sam was struggling with our divorce, but immediately turned cold when the divorce went through and Jacob and Sam became a couple again. Helen was furious, and hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. How could you let Jacob steal your wife without so much as a sob? I was at that holiday party last December and saw how Jacob acted. I was still in love with Jacob and hoped that you would fight for your wife. You didn't do anything. Are you ignorant or just a weakling? This dinner invitation was Helen's attempt to give me some courage. I sat back in my chair, took a sip of my drink, and thought about how I could answer her challenge. Helen, I'm sorry. I don't know you. I don't know how much I can trust you. At the moment, the amount of trust is limited, but I can tell you that I am not a weakling and that there will be consequences someday. Have you ever heard the saying, Revenge is a dish best served cold. Helen looked at me. Damn, I didn't think so. Are you Sicilian? Right, and if you're really interested in some kind of revenge, then just sit quietly for a while and one day I'll call you and ask you for a favor. Nothing illegal but very important. That evening I returned home, and my ideas began to become clearer. But could I trust Helen to keep her mouth shut? I secretly made inquiries with someone I could trust, and he confirmed Helen's story. Helen and Jacob dated, and their breakup coincided with the discovery of Sam and Jacob's relationship. While we were talking, my source apologized for missing the first date and not warning me in advance. He kindly reported that the company's senior management was tired of the romantic trauma surrounding Jacob's affairs, was in the process of rewriting the company's workplace romance policy, and that Jacob was rumored to be skating on very thin ice. During my separation and for two months after my divorce, I hired escorts for my sexual and social release. Cindy Fox and I would go to dinner or a show every two to three weeks and end up having sex in bed for a couple of hours before she went home. It cost me a pretty penny, but, as I said, I had nowhere else to spend my increased salary after the promotion. This was my first time paying for sex, at least directly, but I didn't want to tempt myself into getting back into the relationship, so Cindy became my assistant whenever I felt like it. She also became an integral part of my plans. I called Helen and told her that if she agreed, she only had two tasks. First, give me Samantha's schedule for the times when she will be out of town on business. Secondly, at the right time, approach Jacob and ask him to meet her in a public place to Get this over with. Helen called me the next day. Sam had to leave town in two weeks for three days and nights. Helen contacted Jacob and agreed to meet him on the first night of Sam's trip at the bar, just for a drink and a chat. But I'm sure Jacob thought he might be meeting Helen for the last time. Cindy laughed when I explained the first part of my plan. 
but I really shocked her when I explained the second part. Cindy, have any of the women who do what you do ever contracted a social illness? I'm not talking about deadly things like AIDS. I'm talking about treatable things like gonorrhea. Of course this happens, but rarely. Most girls insist on condoms. I know a couple who have sex without a condom, but they try to be discreet and charge double for the privilege. There were a couple of these girls who had to undergo treatment. Do me a favor, please. Let me know when one of the girls has something to add. I'll pay her for bareback sex, and I'll pay you the same as for the search. You're kidding, right? Do you want to give this guy anything? Nothing fatal. Just something to ruin his wedding night. Everything was ready for the first part. Cindy told me the details later that evening. She was sitting at the bar, sipping a cocktail, when Jacob walked in and sat down next to her. They exchanged smiles, and Jacob ordered a scotch. Cindy was dressed in a casual business suit and looked very professional. Almost immediately, Jacob's cell phone rang. Of course, Helen, I understand. I hope your mom gets better. Jacob hung up and immediately turned to Cindy. Hi, I just got dumped because my girlfriend's mom got sick. Can I buy you some more? Cindy smiled widely at Jacob. Of course I can handle two, but don't try to get me drunk. I was on the road for two weeks, and during these two weeks I did not see my husband. The girl starts to get excited. Cindy flashed the engagement ring that I bought at the pawn shop for the occasion. It was like waving a red cape at a bull. Jacob took the bait. My name is Jacob. Nice to meet you. Anne. They drank and chatted a bit for half an hour. Cindy was actually on her third drink and was trying her best to appear a little tipsy. Before she finished the third, Jacob tried his best to seduce her. Light touches on her arm and leg, charming conversation with just enough sexual innuendo to try to warm her up. Cindy told me it was hard not to laugh at all the work he put into it, considering she was getting paid. Finally, she got tired of seducing. She finished her cocktail and invited him to come up to her room. Jacob and Cindy had sex in her room twice. Of course, Jacob didn't know that the entire event was being photographed. Cindy kicked him out, saying she needed to come to her senses and get some sleep, but not before she got his cell number. Then she and I looked at the photos on my laptop. I promised that all photographs in which she could be identified would be erased before the camera or memory card left the room. Even after deleting half the photos, we still had dozens of Jacob having sex with this stranger. There was still a month left before the wedding, and I hoped that we would be lucky before the end of the month. Two weeks later, Cindy called me with the news. One of the girls has gonorrhea. I only found out about this because she asked me and another girl to cover for her while she took her medicine. Did you tell her about my request? Briefly. She's willing to talk, but keep in mind that she's a professional and will probably charge you double because she thinks you'll have a hard time finding a replacement. What about your bet? Does it change? No, I guess we made a deal and you always take good care of me. And it's true because I always left her an extra tip. So Cindy and I met with this young lady and worked out the details for part two. It will cost me a few thousand, but it's worth it. Cindy calls Jacob the next day. Hello, Jacob, darling. This is Anne from the Hyatt Hotel. Remember me? How could I forget? Are you in the city? Yes, I wondered if you were ready for extraordinary sex. That will change your life. Quite self-confident. We had a lot of fun that evening, but what are you willing to do to make it extraordinary sex? I'm here at the Hyatt Hotel with a colleague. She's wild. And after what I told her, she thought you could handle both of us this evening. Can you handle it? Of course, Jacob's self-esteem led him to believe that two women wanted to have extraordinary sex with him. I just need to make a quick call and I'll be in the lobby. Not in the hall. Just go up to room 449. We'll be here. Bring some of the capitals, chilled. When Jacob arrived in room 449, our mystery girl was there, but Cindy was not. Where is Anne? He asked. Anne received a call from home. Her son fell ill, and she returned to her room, introducing her husband to the daily routine. She said this was his first time dealing with a sick child. But you and I can start. And they did it. Cindy never showed up, but our mystery girl did her best to make Jacob forget about the threesome. 
After he left at 10, she met us at a local cafe and collected the balance I owed her. I admit I felt like crap doing that to the guy, but he's such an ass that by the time he left, I had almost calmed down. She took the envelope and walked out the door. Cindy looked at me and shrugged. I told you she's a professional. You paid me for the night. Do you want to come to your place and have sex with me? I wanted to. And we went. I waited a week after the wedding and finished my project. Both Sam and her company received envelopes in the mail with false return addresses. Both envelopes contained a short letter and a set of photographs. Sam's letter said, Dear Mrs. Harris, Sorry to break the bad news, but it appears that your husband and my wife were dating while she was in your city. A private investigator hired to obtain evidence provided me with these photographs. I've only included the ones that show his face, so you have no doubt it's him. I wasn't going to tell you, except that I just got a message from my doctor that she gave me a social disease. You may want to get tested. He signed up, the future ex-husband of your husband's slut. The letter to the CEO stated, Dear sir, just thought you should know what kind of person works at your company. According to my wife, he picked her up at a bar, got her drunk, and infected her with a social disease. I don't know if this letter will reach you or if you care, but I would keep an eye on this bastard. He seems to have no morals. He signed, One Regretful Husband. Everything quickly fell into place. Sam's family dissolved the marriage, Jacob was fired, and there are rumors that they were both on medication. I was pretty much busy getting my life together. Sometimes I imagined the subsequent scenarios. In one scenario, I beat the crap out of Jacob. In another, I pretend to return to Sam, take her to a foreign country, and then leave her there without any cards or passport. I could have done the same if it weren't for the vision of her mother and what it would do to her. I may have been so cruel to my ex-wife, but not to my ex-mother-in-law but I quickly lost interest as my new job became more interesting and challenging. This continued until the next Simoncelli family picnic. Uncle Vin, my father's older brother, was there. Uncle Vin is tied up, if you know what I mean. He called me over and we chatted quietly. Johnny, tell me about your divorce. What happened? I like that girl. I told Uncle Vin's version of our breakup in Reader's Digest. What did you do with it? I then explained what I did to get revenge. It's terrible, but it's not exactly scorched earth. No, Uncle Vin, I did my best to put this behind me. I took the high road. I explained to him why. This is good, and these are good reasons. You know, that baseball coach really did you a good service. Uncle Wynn was no bigot or less of a bigot when it came to race, but he always thought it was funny that a black man from the slums of Chicago had the same influence on my life as my father. If you had been like your hot-tempered dad, you wouldn't be the person you are today. Many times I had to calm my little brother down or he would end up dead or in jail. Have you ever talked to Coach Price? Only a few times. And not since my senior year of college. I kind of lost touch with him. You should look for him. He volunteers at the Boys and Girls Club of West Palmer. Let him know what he did for you. It's nice for a man to hear that from time to time. But right now, go to your father... Hug him and tell him that you love him. He needs to hear it too. Uncle Vin was a funny guy. I heard that many people are afraid of him, but next to me, he always behaved like a teddy bear. I actually went to see Coach Price and he convinced me to start volunteering at the club. I even started dating his niece, a beautiful woman, but that's another story and will have to be posted in the romance section of Literatica. In other words, no drama, just love. And one last thing. For my 30th birthday, I received a birthday card from Uncle Vin. It simply said, Happy birthday, nephew. Nobody laughs at Simoncelli. It seems one Jacob Harris was found last night in the alley behind the bar he frequents. He was the victim of a robbery. Nothing life-threatening, but he had a broken nose, several fingers and ribs. I guess his black belt must have stayed home that night. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.